Hello, I'm the Paisley Print Arthur, and you are somebody listening to the Paisley Print Arthur. But you probably already knew that. Today I'm going to have an extended rant about poetry. But first, I'm going to read you a poem. How fascinating. This is called Blood Cell, and I wrote it the other day. Uh, it references a few other poems I've written, so if you're a fan, you might get some of these references. Some unassuming moat, that's how it starts. In the moat of rainwater, ancient steps become colonised by lichen. Sig packs and freshers, flyers lie sodden, as if some student exploded here. The jokes just write themselves. And I sat only once to write a poem. Slipped and lost it apart from a slim memory, slipped between those two lines above, where drones would one day film the place as if anyone ever sat here to do anything besides absorb the novelty of the fact that sometimes people filmed it with drones. And a slimy line or two made their way further and I slipped into something more comfortable, like the greasy feel of blood before it dries. And I coursed through the courses with coarse suit, crash jokes of coarse and caricature, carcass and canvas bags like a tourist, making jokes about terminal taurus and bleeding my way through tube to tube to tube station back to corridor to back to back with the more famous ghost of a future self, where the world was split from past to present, where spiralling half-fossils scoffed upward at dress shoes, clip-clopping like horses every July as we coagulated. Then, to reconvene on younger feet each September, to survive half the night and fracture during the clotting of darkened bodies under mock ambulance strobe. And that's quite an interesting one. I'm a big fan of it. That's the first draft. Sort of. It's a 1.5 draft because some of the words are highlighted, which means I may at some point chisel at them. Um, But that's basically a first draft. I apologise for the creaking. I've turned my office chair into a rocking chair recently. And that's about my experience at university, starting off as the unassuming moat, uh, where there's torrential rain all the time. And then mock ambulance strobe is, you know, disco lights at the SU, um, reference to the Ammonites in the marble flooring, that sort of stuff. So if you went to university with me, which is about 10% of my audience, uh, because I often bully my friends into pretending they like my poetry, Um, because you're not really a true poet unless you bully your friends and family into buying your books, are you? I don't think you are. I'm probably talking a bit too quiet as well. So I, I'm working on it. I'm I'm working on it. I may have news about microphones in the future. Um, I'm going to try and get on a course to teach me how to be really good at reading and whatnot and doing words. Anyway, my rant is actually an Instagram post. It's quite a shiny one. So I'm just going to read that. And it's about the hyper-personal in poetry and how I feel about the hyper-personal. And what the hyperpersonal is, in case anybody doesn't know, because I've made the term up myself, so I imagine probably don't. You can guess, though. Poetry does not have to be confessional. In fact, I'd argue that it can be worse when it is. A current trend in poetry is the pressure to write something confessional, or at least personal. This works for many people, but it can push readers and potential writers away if they aren't comfortable writing or listening to it, or simply want something more inventive or creative or struggle to relate to the subject matter. To some people, listening to hyper-personal poetry often feels like an invasion of the poet's privacy, and that uneasy feeling doesn't go away easily. Some readers I've asked about this refer to it as exposure therapy, and one person even said, the only stories some people have are gossip. The rise of the hyper-personal is a weird thing to me that seems to be alienating its own audience. It is distinctly strange to see people's deeply personal experiences monetized as well. What if a poet becomes typecast as a sad breakup poet? I'm sorry, Taylor Swift, I don't mean you. Will they need to return to the bad thoughts to make money in the future? If an album is all about sad things, will that artist have to return to bad thoughts, sad times, to continue making money? If a poet writes only through trauma, 
Should those harrow harrowing diary entries then become marketed products or should they remain private? How does it affect somebody's mental health? If there's no artistry around the um, nugget of truth, I like to compare truth and reality to a, a pill that some people don't quite like to swallow, so you wrap it up in ham. The poem, the poetic stuff, the poesis, as some people call it, for some unknown reason, that's the ham, the artifice, the stage play, the performance, the movie making, that is the ham. The message, or the personal truth, or whatever you want to call it, that's the pill. A lot of people don't want pills thrown in their face. They want a nice bit of ham. Anyway, wordplay seems to be slowly sinking into the shadows as the hyperpersonal replaces the universal. And the trick is no longer to write something, but to say something, to say anything, and to say it loud. This isn't inherently bad, however, despite my own personal opinion. Poetry can be a brilliant tool for processing personal experience, as poetry is often a loose thought-like thing. It's thought-like in structure, and it's easy to write. But that doesn't mean the end result of therapy poetry should be put in print and marketed. So coming to the pressure to market deeply personal experiences opens up vulnerable people to the marketplace of literature, where your poetry can and will be criticised as the product you have turned it into. But the hyperpersonal insulates itself from this criticism. How can you critique a hyperpersonal poem as a piece of art without the poet taking it seriously and personally? Is a hyperpersonal poem a piece of art? I read a poem quite recently. It was basically, and I'm going to paraphrase it, but this is pretty close. I am sad, line break, because when you left, line break, you left your hair clips in the bathroom, line break. It reminds me of my aunt, line break, who died. And that's basically what a lot of poetry is these days. And it helps people out on a personal level. I get that. But when it becomes marketed as a product, you see this uneasy gap where people are getting upset that their diary entries aren't selling. They're going, oh, nobody cares about my problems. That may be true. Nobody cares about you turning your problems into a product. You know, you go... Go to a therapist. You say that. You can't really do that in the UK. They don't exist. Therapists have yet to be invented in the UK. People have to go to poetry evenings instead. Um, anyway, the hyperpersonal insulates itself from critique. An attachment to the unprocessed subject matter, to the unresolved issues within the hyperpersonal, raises the poem and the poet above artistic critique. Because to critique personal poetry is seen on an attack of, on the validity of the poet's experience of the subject. Because if a poem is just gossip, if it's just something that's happened, then critiquing it feels to a lot of people like a critique of the thing that happened or a critique of their account. Um, and that becomes especially jarring when somebody's the victim of a crime and they read a poem out about that and somebody goes, well, it's not a very well-written poem. Because the thing is, you're marketing it. If you're marketing it and selling it, it becomes a product in this marketplace of ideas. People have the right to criticise it. People have the right to say, why doesn't it rhyme? I get that a lot. <laughs> I get that a lot. I do write rhyming stuff, but it's usually um, jokes. Anyway, the rise of the hyperpersonal has also erased some of the artistry from poetry, as the process of designing a poem is no longer derived from the act of designing it, but from the act of taking something emotionally raw, tearing it out of yourself and putting it onto paper. This creates a new poetry that reads like diary entries with line breaks and alienates its readers by being hyper-specific, narrowing its potential for wider understanding. To conclude, there are different ways people use poetry, and recently, the hyperpersonal has bled into the public, where it is then marketed as a product which, due to the author's closeness to the subject, becomes a mental health risk if anyone treats it as a product. Um, see the recent issue with uh, Billie Eilish, I hope I pronounced her second name right, where people were accusing her of quote-unquote queerbaiting and asking her what her sexuality is, as if that matters to anyone at all. So now, if she is one sexuality, she'll feel pressure to reveal it. If she isn't, She'll feel pressured to reveal that. And if she doesn't reveal it, then in later on when she reveals it, people will say she's not legitimate. And it's like her very personal life is being marketed as a product. People are talking about it. It's gossip. And that's the direction poetry's going in. And I don't know who to blame, but I'm just warning you because I'm from the future. 
Um, I didn't have time to really get into the glorification of mental illness, but that's also a thing in a lot of poetry. You know, I don't know if many of you have been on Tumblr. Uh, oh, suicidal people are just angels that want to go home. And that kind of glorifying of self-harm and also eating disorders. I see that it does blood it does it is bleeding in into poetry uh especially instagram stuff i see a lot of people writing about really horrible sad stuff and then their poems go viral and then you get this cycle where i've spoke to some younger poets and they've said well i i feel like i need a story like that so i can succeed but behind the scenes they're actually writing some really cool like fantasy epic or something genuinely artistic that has a lot of meaning in it, but that the common person, who, by the way, is an idiot, the common person, 80% of the world's population, being incredibly stupid, just doesn't... They don't want that. That's, that's not true, by the way. It's just me being mean. But, you know, the, the, the simplest products are the easiest to market, and being sad about a breakup is something that a lot of people have experienced, which is an odd paradox, because whilst it's a universal experience, it's also a hyper-personal one, because people talk about the very specifics of their breakup i've read i read and heard a poem by somebody where he was talking about how a girl broke up with him by a fountain in his local town and the entire poem was about that fountain um and at the end of it the person sat next to me turned to me and said i i, I have no idea what that fountain looks like it's like he managed to describe it for about 10 minutes and it didn't go anywhere and i think there's a very weird disconnect in poetry at the moment where people feel that they have to come out as something they have to have some kind of experience um i i even in the publishing industry and i'm gonna get told off for this if anybody actually hears this but i've spoken to somebody recently and she said that she felt she had to reveal her sexuality or prove herself to a potential publisher because she was writing a story with um two LGBT characters in it and a potential publisher said, well, are you of this persuasion? Are you in that genre of human that likes this kind of thing at this in this position? Do you like that? Could you prove it? You know, you may as well just ask people for pictures. And I, I think that's, it's getting quite crass now. And I, you know, my sense of humor is pretty dark and dirty, but I don't like it in the real world when people push people to come out as something. I personally have been asked numerous times what my sexuality is, and my, my answer is always, it's none of your fucking business. Because it isn't. It's barely any of my business. You just like who you like. That's, that's how I always see it. Um, but there's a pressure among poets to just have some kind of story, and not a story as in a fictional story, but a personal story that becomes marketed as a product. And I think that's quite disturbing to think about because it's turning into gossip magazines. You know, chat books are becoming gossip magazines and there's no artifice anymore. There's no wordplay. There's no trickery. There's no tripping the reader up. There's no different tracks. There's no... Um, a poetry professor at university said something quite good and it was about how you know, some proper poems, some poems, you can only really get into the gritty undercarriage and really understand them and understand the mechanisms that power them if you read other poems by the same poet. So if you read a one poem from a collection, you're going to go, oh, it's about a saxophone, I don't, I don't really get it. But if you read the whole collection, then it makes sense. So a poem is a piece... It's a puzzle in itself, but it's also the piece of a larger puzzle. I, I, I would say a, a good poem from my, as you can tell, quite biased perspective. A good poem would be a, a fractal mosaic of ideas. So there's something underneath it that you can dig up. You only need it in that poem. There's something above it that relates to the universal, that everybody can read it and go, oh, I get that. Or I know someone that's been through that. Or I understand that experience like some poems are just about a tree and for some reason they're very interesting i don't know how people manage it i've certainly never managed myself i've been told i wrote an interesting poem about a brick once in 2013 i don't think i could do it again so i've got to find that poem 
Um, unfortunately, I think I put it in one of those little um, flaps in the floor where they put electrical sockets uh, for, for a joke. No, wait, that would have been flammable. I wouldn't have done that. Where would I put it? I've no idea. What oh, it was a cake. I hid a cake once in like one of those, you know, for TV aerials that they have in like lecture theatres. Put a cake in there. Because it had two years before it went out of date, and I thought, I'll return to it, and I returned to it, um, and it was mouldy. So, um, I'm not going to point out what cake company that was. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm ranting about burying cakes in floors now. What were we talking about? I wish I had guests. I do actually have guests upcoming. At some point, I will have guests. I won't just be talking into the void. But yeah, um, poetry in the hyperpersonal. It is a strange thing. I think I've been to poetry events where the host has said, oh, this is really great. It's like group therapy. And that's something to be boasted about in those circles. And I, I, I think it's weird. There's no storytelling. Isn't poetry a type of fiction? Well, it's a type of creative writing. You could argue it doesn't need to be fictional. But I think it has, has to have some artifice in it for it to be art. You know, people paint pictures of people because it's more interesting to them than a photograph, and if a poem's hyper-personal, and, you know, it's a bad analogy because photographs by professional photographers, they're framed well, they've got the lighting right. Uh, with the hyper-personal stuff, they just list facts. They just say a list of things that happened to them. But the thing that tricks the, the public into thinking it's really poetic is that when they talk about it, they talk about it like this. The day behind Tesco supermarket in Manchester once saw a man throw up alphabet spaghetti and he looked down into his hands and they spelled get help. And like people, people read it out like that. And it has this weird intonation to it and it jumps around and it sounds all cool on the stage and you, it's dynamic and people go, oh, wow. Very good. There's a poem. It's not a poem. You've just read stuff out in the same way I would read stuff out back when my asthma was worse. Um, <laughs> I think I'll leave it at that because it's nearly we're nearly at 18 minutes now and most reasonable people probably tuned out 17 and a half minutes ago. So I've been the Paisley Print author. You've been my favourite person in the universe. Thank you to the five people that listen to this podcast right now. I genuinely do really appreciate it. If you know how to message me on Paisley Print Author on Instagram, I'll give you a free ebook because I'm that happy that you're following me on Spotify. It's cool. I appreciate it. I don't think I'm that interesting. You do. It's great. We have a disagreement already. We'll be great friends. I'll send you a free ebook. Message me on Paisley Print Author on Instagram. Thank you. Good night. I've been the Paisley Print Author. You've been someone who may or may not receive a free ebook. Stay innovative, stay cool, and write poems that are weird. Please, for the love of God, just be weird. Continue, just get weird. Go do some weird stuff. Meow at a shop assistant, please. The world needs more weird.